Hello, hello, hello guys, and welcome back to Joe's Ventures, and today we're going to be doing part 87 of our Planet Zoo Mod Spotlights, so we'll take a look at some of the wonderful mods people have been making, and use them to talk about some of the wonderful biodiversity that we share our world with. So, today, uh, we've got quite a bit more fish than last time, last time was a bit of a special episode, we had all sorts of cool things, but um, we've got a lot of fish this time, with some couple new um, cool animals we got. A mammal, a bird, and a reptile, so that's going to be really, really awesome to go through, and a really cool bird, I shall say, and I've got a lot of love for this animal right here, but we're going to be starting off with some fish today. Most of these have been ported, of course, from games like Fishing Planet, um, free model holding sites, things like that. Uh, we've got here, starting off, this one comes from Fishing Planet, we've got the African Big Eye Catfish, also known as the Aluminum Catfish, is another name for it. Really, really cute little guy here. So the uh, African uh, big-eyed catfish. These also get the name kind of the uh, golden... Their name means in um, Greek, uh, golden fish. So that's a kind of cool name. Uh, these guys are a freshwater fish uh, found in Africa. These guys are typically found in the Congo River Basin and typically lots of larger rivers. Uh, these guys like to live in tropical waters that are about 20 to 25 degrees Celsius, so definitely a tropical species. And um, these guys can get actually to quite a large size. Uh, the maximum size is uh, at maturity, we don't know, but we know that they get about 70 centimeters long uh, for snout to um, snout length in, uh, in these guys. But also we know that's for males and unsexed individuals, so quite a decent sized fish. And in terms of young, these guys are only popular as young in the aquarium trade because they get quite big. And these guys have a generalist diet. These guys feed mainly on worms in captivity, but I assume most likely these guys would be pretty much feeding on whatever they can get their mouths around in the wild. Uh, not too much is known about these guys since um, the Congo Basin is not that well studied compared to a lot of other places. Be a really, really awesome fish. Uh, yeah. These are also considered least concerns, so they're co quite common in the river ecosystem, but they are obviously threatened by habit destruction, pollution, pollution, most things that threaten wild populations of fish, but they seem to be doing quite well. And yeah, not sadly not too well studied or not well known, but really, really awesome little fishy here. So this was done by Leaf Buff Sue and Fishing uh, Planet, uh, obviously ported from there. Next one done by the same people, we've got the African Bulldog Fish, another really cool guy here. So let's have a look at these wonderful guys over here. African bulldog fish. So this species is called um, Metronensis um, macrolipidosis, which is a type of... Ray, uh, and these guys are a relative of things like elephant fishes. Uh, they're a type of bony tongue fish. Um, these guys are typically found in fresh water, just like your Af uh, African big-eyed catfish. These guys like tropical water between... Um, 22 to uh, 21 degrees Celsius, uh, which is pretty cool. And these are protodromous, so they tend to migrate a little bit down rivers. Uh, in terms of distribution, these guys are found in the lower Zambezi River and the, and the deltas upstream, such as like Victoria Falls and also the um, Pujue Rivers. Also the upper and central Congo Basin, these guys can be also found in. Uh, also east uh, flowing rivers in Tanzania and the Okavango. So quite a common uh, fish across uh Sub-Saharan Africa in those areas. So these guys reach a maximum uh, reach a maximum of about 32 centimeters, uh, so a little over a foot long, uh, in male and un or unsexed specimens. Uh, and their maximum weight's about 500 grams or about half a kilo, so still a decent sized fish, quite awesome there. So these guys uh, can be tailed apart a little bit differently from their relatives. They have a number of scales, which is um, Come around there, they're circumperpendicular, so like some scales around here that kind of tells the difference apart from them. And they've also got this really interesting, like, um, mouth here you can see. Uh, it helps with um, catching their food, of course. They also have uh, a greater body length than some of its relatives, and they have uh, longer neuter of its electronic organ in discharge in females and juveniles. 
So these guys are caught often with dip nets in Zambia, and they prefer typically well vegetated with muddy bottom and marginal habitats, and like rivers and floodplains, things like that. There are shoaling species, and they tend to move inshore after dark. They migrate within these rivers, and they are recorded to move up tributaries and shoals uh, during the flood season. And then the diet they typically feed on invertebrates, especially like midge and mayfly larvae and pupae, which is taken from the bottom and off plant stems, so that really helps with their ecology there. Uh, they typically breed during the raining season in shallow vegetated locations, and females can carry up to 6,000 eggs inside her. And they possess electroreceptors along the entire head and on the ventral and dorsal regions of the body, but they're average, uh, absent on the side and caudal um, penuptial, uh, where the electronic organ is located, uh, which is pretty cool. These guys have a little bit of electricity going on there. So they are able to detect electricity, very similar to things like sharks, which is very cool. And they are also considered least concerned. They are considered a game fish, so they're sometimes fish. Same with the African big eye catfish. They're sometimes considered a food fish or a commercial fish. These guys are typically caught for aquariums and a game fish. So really, really cool animal here. I do like these guys. Again, from Leaf Buff Sue and ported from Fishing Planet. Another cool fish here. Next, we're moving on to another African fish. We've got here the African pike, which is a really, really cool guy here. Let's have a looky-loo. So the African pike, or the African pike um, charagon, is a predatory fish in the family Hypsiridae. And they get the name the pike is because they're not actually related to true pikes. They have a very similar body. Um, they only resemble that way due to convergent evolution. They occupy a similar niche in their ecosystems, like a kind of a large predator. So they kind of just evolved that way because they occupy a similar niche in the ecosystem. So these guys, their scientific name is... Hepcestus obdo, I believe you say that, and these guys uh, can reach about 28 centimeters or about 11 inches long. And you can see the back here is normally quite a dark black uh, or green, while the belly tends to be a bit more silver. And the head is normally a light green to brown with distinct stripes on that as well. And the cut and the color and pattern of the adult fish is relatively stable, but juvenile fish they tend to be more variable in their colors. So these guys, in terms of their distribution, uh, they're found across Western Sub-Saharan Africa. So they're found in the Sindana River, uh, in the west of the Central African Republic, and in the east. And they also can be found in Cameroon. So quite a wide distribution in Western Sub-Saharan uh, Sub -Saharan Africa. They're also considered least concerned, so they're still quite common in their range. Really, really awesome fish. Uh, these guys actually prefer quiet and deep waters, and they may actually only live for about five years, so not a long-lived fish. Um, spawning for these guys will typically begin in August and continue up until January. And in some locations, there is extended spawning season that lasts until May. The eggs are laid in a bubble net, and then they then guard the young uh, until they hatch. They've attached themselves to the bottom of the nest, and of which the stage the adults abandon the nest and their young. So they basically make this bubble nest, wait for the eggs to attach, and then basically bugger off. Um, they... Uh, the nest breaks up about four days and afterwards the juveniles will disperse and live in these very well vegetated marginal habitats that they seem to prefer. In terms of their diet, these guys are piscivores, so they primarily feed on smaller fish and they're mainly diurnal and are an ambush predator, hence why they kind of evolve very similar to pikes. So they typically wait along dense submerged and emergent vegetation until prey comes within range and then they lunge at it. Uh, the diet of these guys... Um, consists of predominantly things like cichlids and myids, and all those smaller individuals have been seen eating catfishes more than um, cichlids and more myids. Uh, these guys also prefer the upper courses of small rivers, with the elongate tigerfish is absent or less abundant, so they kind of avoid the lower parts of their habitat just to um, escape the larger predators. And they also use weeds and vegetation along with its colouring to avoid detection, so they're quite cryptic. In terms of their human use, these guys are often a game fish, and they've uh, often caught for the aquarium trade and human consumption. But luckily, they are considered least concerned, because it's not really considered that they're being overfished. But still a really, really awesome animal regardless. We do like our fishes here. Again, done by Leaf Buff Sue and Fishing Planet, uh, ported from there, along with most of these other fishes here. So next, we're going into the, from the, obviously, waterways of... Uh, sub-saharan africa we're moving up to some marine fish which is pretty cool we've got here the threadfin butterfly fish done by leaf buff sue and i can't uh 3d model another 3d model hosting site i can't read the really read the name of it 
But um, anyway, these guys are a marine raven fish. These are a type of butterfly fish, quite a cool fish. Uh, these guys are typically found in the Indo-Pacific region, so they're found from the Red Sea around Eastern Africa to the Hawaiian, um, Delusa Islands, um, north of southern Japan and south of Lord Howe. Uh, typically at depths between 1 and 35 meters, or about uh, 3 to 115 feet deep, so quite a shallow living fish. Uh, these guys uh, also get up to about 23 centimeters long, about 9 inches or so in length. Let's see if we can find one swimming. There's one swimming. Um, really, really cool fish. And their body is white and they have these chevron markings on their side with the tear edge of the dorsal fin having a prominent black spot and they also have a th prominent black band that goes around their eyes. Uh, they also have uh, the rear of soft dorsal fin with the trailing filament that you can kind of see there. And they have these bright yellow fins. And there are two subspecies sometimes recognized within this um, group. There is... Um, Chalinodon angura angura, which occurs in the Red Sea and lacks, la uh, lasses this, uh, and lacks the eye spot. And then the other subspecies, the Chalinodon angura sephiter, which is the spotted population which can be found in occurring outside the Red Sea. So this is the one you typically see out the Red Sea, but the ones that you wouldn't see out the Red Sea would, wouldn't have that little spot there. That spot would be, just be absent. So these guys... Uh, belong to their like own large group of large genus uh Raphodon, which might actually might be its own distinct genus and they are distinguished by, by lots of colorations things like that really really awesome fish very similar to most other types of uh butterfly fish really really cool guys so um yeah i think it's really cool to cover these guys these also are least concerned so they're not at risk at immediate of extinction they're considered populations happy and healthy though obviously sometimes collecting for the aquarium trade can be a bit of an issue there uh, really really awesome fish i'm a big fan so we're really gunning through these so that's awesome next we've got up we've got the arctic grayling a really really cool fish here so this is the arctic grayling uh these guys are a freshwater fish in the family uh salmonidae these guys are typically found throughout the Arctic and Pacific drainages of Siberia, Alaska, and Canada, as well as the upper Mississippi River in Montana. And this is an introduced population and found in the Lee Valley and other lakes in the White Mountains, so that's pretty cool. Uh, these guys have been recorded to get to a maximum length of about 76 centimeters, or about 30 inches, and a maximum recorded weight of 3.8 kilograms, or 8 pounds or so. And of these guys, he's typically distinguished from the European grayling because they have an absence of a dorsal or anal spines and by the presence of a number, larger number of soft rays in their um, fins. And they also have this dark mid-lateral band between their pectoral and pelvic fins. And their flanks also have this pink iridescence, as you can kind of see here. And they've been recorded to live up to 18 years, so quite a long-lived fish. As I mentioned, they're quite widespread across the Atlantic Ocean drainages around like the Hudson Bay, uh, in Canada and Alaska, also Alberta and British Columbia. Um, they also have um, found in the Rudy River, also Lake Great Lakes in Michigan. They also occur in Siberia, uh, around East European Russia and some tributaries of the Prakota River. And lake dwelling forms of these guys have been introduced into like the Rocky Mountains and things like that, and actually as far south as Arizona. So most of their natural range is kind of up more in rivers and things like that, but there have been some landlocked populations introduced into some areas, uh, and it's far south as Arizona. So several life histories have been found of these guys. There's like fluvial populations that live and spawn in rivers, populations that will thrive and spawn in lakes, and then the protodromous populations that uh, thrive in lakes and spawn in tributaries. So... These guys like primarily cold waters of mid to life sized rivers and lakes where they will return to the rocky streams to breed. The various subspecies of these guys are omnivorous, so they'll feed on crustaceans, insects, uh, and their larvae. Also, fish eggs are also pretty important. Larger specimens can also be a bit um, piscivorous, so they'll eat other smaller fish. And immature fish typically feed on insect larvae and zooplankton. So typically, spawning for these guys will take place in the spring uh there's none swimming around here i don't think uh, anyway we'll wait for one to come swim where is it there's gotta be four in here Let's see if i can find the other one there's four there but we'll just wait until one's finished 
Okay, we'll just wait for them to do that. Uh, spawning typically takes place around spring, and the adult fish seek shallow areas and river with fine sand substrate and moderate currents to breed. Uh, males are territorial and caught females by flashing their quite colorful dorsal fins, as you can see here. Very, very awesome. Uh, males are also territorial, as I mentioned, yeah, territorial, and the fins are used to uh, brace receptive females during the uh, vibrationary release of the Milton Row. And these guys also are non garters so they typically don't guard the eggs when the, after being laid. The eggs are typically left to mix it in the substrate and um, just survive there. Although these guys do not excavate a nest, the high energetic courtship of these guys will technically kick up fine materials of the sediment and will cover the uh, eggs as well. The zygotes or the little baby ones are small, approximately about 3 millimeters in diameter, and the embryos will hatch after about 2 or 3 weeks. The newly hatched embryo will remain in the substrate until its yolk has been absorbed, and then they typically emerge at a length of about 12 to 18 millimeters, or 0.5 to 0.7 inches, where they typically form shoals and river margins, and then these juveniles will quickly grow up in their first two years of life. Um, these guys are considered uh, least concerned, so they're quite secure in their range. They're often considered a separate species, throughout, a secure species throughout their range. And although some populations have been extirpated, the wild widespread and they're not listed as endangered by the OCN. Some populations are, though, quite a, a worry for um, local things. Also, things like the fluvial population in the upper Missouri, uh, Mississippi, Missouri River. So that's been another population list under the Endangered Species Act. Uh, the, uni the unique southernmost population is now extirpated from all areas of the basin, except for the Big Hole Watershed. And a lot of these are kind of saying some populations may need attempts to restore and stuff like that. But overall, the species is doing quite well. And also, they're quite economically important. And they're often considered a key subsistence species by the Inuit people or the uh, indigenous peoples of Alaska's North Slope. And they've also been raised commercially for food and one of the most important species for sports fishing in Alaska. So, very, very important species. Really, really cool. So, yeah, another cool fish, the Arctic railing. And next, we've got another cool fish. We've got the Atlantic salmon. So these guys are very, very interesting in terms of... There's a lot known about them. They're very important culturally for people. Really, really awesome salmon here. So these guys are a species of raven fish, also in the family Sa uh, Salmonidae. So these guys are, of course, a salmon. They're actually the third largest salmon as well. They're behind the Siberian Tarmin and the Chinook salmon of the Pacific. And they grow up to about a meter long or so. So... After two years, they typically will reach about 71 to 76 centimeters, or 28 to 30 inches, and get between 3 to 5 kilograms in weight. Uh, but they can get a bit larger. The largest uh, salmon netted was actually like 49 kilos, apparently, uh, or about 109 pounds. And the heaviest recorded ever, and the longest one has been about 160 centimeters, which is the longest on record. So these are just extreme specimens, but they typically get about a meter. Um, the colorations you can see here... Uh, is the adult stage but the young are quite different colored at maturity they take this silvery sheen that they get here and um when they reproduce the males will take on a slight green or red coloration to say have a male and these guys have quite a long body with well-developed teeth and all fins are bordered with black as you can kind of see here very interesting in terms of the habitat the natural breeding grounds of these uh guys are found in europe and the northeastern coast of north america in Europe, they can still be found as far south as Spain and far north as Russia. And because of sport fishing, some of the southern populations in northern Spain have grown smaller, and the species distribu distribution are easily influenced by changes in freshwater habitats and climate. And these guys are a cold water fish, and they're particularly sensitive to changes in the climate and water temperature. So they're very careful about that. So yeah, quite a wide range of species that can be found across areas such as like um, uh, Canada, early, uh, really high parts of the United States. So uh, I believe states like New York, things like that, um, New Jersey as well. But yeah, typically found mostly across Europe and things like that, and they breed in the Atlantic. So in terms of their wild diet, their ecologies, it seems that young salmon will begin a feeding response after a few days after hatching, after the yolk sac has been absorbed. Juveniles will typically feed on small invertebrates, but once they mature, they may actually start to eat small fish. Uh, during this time, they hunt both in the substrate and in the current, and some have actually been known to eat salmon eggs. And the most common foods eaten by these fish is things like caddyflies, blackfish, uh, blackflies, mayflies, and stoneflies. And adults... They actually prefer capelin as their meal of choice, and the capelin uh, 
kind of a silvery fish that grow up to about 10, 20 to 25 centimeters or 8 to 10 inches. So fry and para have been said to be territorial, uh, but evidence showed that uh, that my that's the evidence is not really conclusive. And then they may occasionally be aggressive towards each other. The social hierarchy in these fish is considered unclear, but they are many have been found in schools, especially when leaving estuaries. And adult uh, Atlantic salmon are considered much more aggressive than other salmon, and they're more likely to attack other fish. In terms of life stages, they have quite an interesting life uh, phase. So they typically have a freshwater phase, and that varies between two to eight years. And as the young are in the southern rivers or like the English Channel, they're only one year old when they leave. The further north, they could be over four years. In some places like Quebec, uh, they can even be up to eight years old as they um, leave rivers. So it really just depends on the temperature as well. So this is when they kind of uh, grow up and get big, and then they start to head out to sea. Uh, during these times where they're susceptible to predation, these guys can be eaten by fish and birds. Then they reach their saltwater phase where they become smolt. So the smolt... Uh, kind of begin their trip to the ocean between March and June. Uh, migration also allows them to acclimate to the salinity in, uh, that they're going into. And then they leave their natal streams and rivers, and then they will move out into uh, the water, where they'll actually grow uh, for a bit, like one to four years as they live in the ocean. And they typically migrate from their home streams to an area of continental plate off West Greenland. And they often uh, get predated on by animals such as seals, sharks, halibut, dolphins, uh, seals, humans, things like that. And once they get large enough, they will get ready to return to these um, places where they were born and these streams and kind of go and spawn and hatch. So kind of that cycle going, uh, cycle going over and over again, which is pretty cool. And that's where they breed. And there have been impacts on some populations like beavers. Uh, there's been some declines uh uh, of some salmon species because of beavers since they come out of uh, migration may be limited to that but the presence of juvenile salmon upstream suggests that they penetrate this par so it seems like be beavers and lots of other factors like uh, higher predation temperatures things like that have often caused issues in decline as well also hybridization is a big issue um, they're often raised in aquaculture as well but that's kind of a developing um, thing especially with these guys being aggressive it can be a bit harder to keep them but they seem to be doing okay okay and they're actually really working on providing sustainable food sources for the uh, food supply for these guys because they are considered vulnerable they are at risk from heavy fishing and popular uh, changes in rivers and there's a lot of things that could really hurt their populations especially overfishing but luckily they are um, overall considered uh, least concern but there are uh, populations such in Europe where they're un and um, some other places like the uh, like in Canada where they're considered uh, at risk or under the Endangered Species Act some local populations because their major threats are like habitat change and overfishing like dams blocking the rivers where they need to go down and migrate things like that but luckily there are large restoration efforts so there are species that get a lot of attention so luckily uh, and even People are starting to farm them now, so they seem to be doing quite well in that regard. A really, really awesome fish. I'm a big fan of these uh, cool salmon types. Uh, really cool salmon. So yeah, this was done by uh, Leaf, Buff Sue, and Fishing Planet. Same with the Grayling. So a lot of these come from Fishing Planet. And um, the cool little uh, fish here, the th uh, Threadfin Butterfly Fish. I think it comes from another site. Uh, some, some models or something. But anyway, we're moving on from our fishies. Now we're moving on to some reptiles here so we got here uh, by vincible we have got the american crocodile so a really really cool animal here so the american crocodile is a species of crocodile that is found in the neotropics and is the most widespread of the four extant crocodile species in the americas with populations present in south florida and the coast of mexico and as far south as venezuela and peru so these guys are quite interesting they're quite closely related to things like the orinoco crocodile and the cuban crocodile things like that um, these guys are uh, high fecund species so they have lots of eggs and they have a high adult survival rate and lifespan like other shark uh, not sharks other crocodiles they're quadrupeds they have a long powerful tail and they have nictating membranes on their eyes that allow them to see underwater uh, these guys can get quite big. New hatchlings get about 27 centimeters or 10 and a half inches long and about 60 grams or 2 ounces of, ounces of mass and they tend to grow quite large. An adult from continental rivers can range between 2.9 to 4 meters or 9 to 13 feet long and weighs up to about 382 kilograms or about 842 pounds. 
uh, while females get about two and a half to three meters or eight to nine feet and weigh about 173 kilos and the lower total length representing the average uh, size and sexual maturity so they can get quite big there have been some reports of some getting a little bit larger than that uh, and they're population of is various so there's some that even got to like 15 feet long and even some exceptionally large specimens getting about five to six meters long but a lot of these are dubious reports so we really don't really know if that's actually true or not but these guys as I mentioned they're the most widespread of the crocodilians of the americas they are also saltwater tolerant so they're capable of crossing islands so they can be found in the caribbean and some even on some coastal pacific islands as well so they've been found in the greater Antilles, uh florida southern florida Southern Mexico, Central America, Colombia, Peru, Ecuador, Costa Rica, and they actually coexist with the smaller spectacle caiman and also the Morlaise crocodile, and the also critically endangered Cuban and Orinoco crocodile, so they're quite right in that regard. And there are areas where the hybrids of these guys exist, but um, they obviously don't really impact these populations too much, it seems. So the actually population and... Um, but allowed them to actually colonize in southern uh, south uh, florida which is pr uh, pretty interesting uh but they don't really unable uh the presence of the american alligator is not the reason why they was unable to populate brackish waters and they seem to be less tolerant to the cold that's why they're only restricted to the southern tip of florida and places such as sam beach where they can find uh find that and the population in florida is believed to be about 2000 or so so endangered where they are but they're um still a stable population and in terms of their diet, these guys are apex predators, similar to other crocodiles. They will, will eat whatever aquatic or terrestrial animals they can find in their freshwater, coastal, or riparian habitats. The snout of the American crocodile is uh, quite a bit broader than other speci uh, specialized fish-eating crocodilians, so like gharials. So they pretty much eat whatever they can get their mouths around. That's like prey species for young, maybe like insects and snails. But adults may eat things like large birds, mammals, turtles, crabs, uh, frogs, fish. Uh, even some places in Florida, they get reported eating uh, snakes, mullets, opossums, raccoons, flamingos, moorhens, pickeries, uh, large sea turtles. Pretty much whatever that's big enough for them to eat, they will. And in terms of their reproduction, these guys will typically breed in late fall to early winter where they engage in drawn out mating ceremonies where they admit low frequency bellows. Uh, and typically body size is the most important determination of this. So the bigger you are, the more likely you'll get to breed. And then February and March, these gravid females will create a nest similar to other crocodiles and uh, along the water's edge and then they will lay the eggs in there they're typically about 30 to 70 eggs depending on her size and after laying them they she'll cover them and guard them and it takes about 75 to 80 days for them to incubate where the females guard them and the females actually been known to guard their nests with ferocity so these guys will uh protect them from like raccoons coates uh skunks foxes uh coyotes black bears they are very very protective of their babies um and, in, and green iguanas have actually been seen to dig up uh, American crocodile eggs occasionally, but in several cases they were caught by the mother crocodile and eaten. <laughs> uh, these guys exist mainly in tropical areas with distinct raining seasons, and the young will hatch near the time of the first rains in the summer, so typically July, August, and then the preceding dry season and before the bodies of water flood. So in the state of development, their young the, of the young, the mother crocodile will take care of their babies. She will basically guard them and then they will go out and fight food for themselves and she'll carry them to water sources things like that and as hatchlings they typically are about 24 to 27 centimeters or 9 and 12 uh, 10 and a half inches and they hunt prey within a few days of hatching and it's not a common common for the mother to take care of these baby crocodiles for up to like a uh, few weeks after they hatch and she'll be attentive um sadly most of these babies won't survive and they'll get preyed upon by birds uh other reptiles large fish like tarpans also like uh other reptiles such as boa constrictors and things like that spectacle caimans but there will be a few that survive and they do grow rapidly as they feed on insects fish and frogs and then they'll even eat each other sometimes but the ones that do survive they'll get big enough and um big enough to breed and start the cycle all over again so in terms of their conservation status these guys are considered vulnerable but they have not been assessed since 1996 these guys are typically at, uh risk for things like poaching and killing and because of pollution loss of habitat commercial farming these guys are considered endangered in parts of their range overall they're considered vulnerable 
but they seem to be doing okay. There's been some rampant punching in some areas, but they seem to be overall doing well. There's an estimated one to 2,000 uh, American crocodiles living in Mexico, Central, and South America, but population is, uh, data is limited, with another about 500 to 1,200, I believe, to live in Southern Florida. So they are um, vulnerable, uh, but they believe to be doing okay. Uh, and most of the crocodiles, they tend to be have a weird relationship with humans. Fatalities are rare, but these are kind of the most common crocodile that... Um, will actually attack people in the area and there have been some reports of them hurting people and in florida as well in 2014 uh, but they typically uh very much avoid humans similar to most other large crocodile species they tend to avoid humans as much as they can but yeah really really awesome animal and i hope they become least concerned soon enough they're really beautiful animals and how can you not love crocodiles really really awesome so again that was done by vincible did a really wonderful job of that so next we've got a bird so this is one i have personal experience with uh one that i've obviously encountered as well so we have got here the north island brown kiwi so these are really cool guys uh, they're one of the five species of kiwi they're the only key uh they're one of the most common species of kiwi uh there's about thirty-five thousand living around parts of the north island the rarest being the orinoco bank ground kiwi with about 500 or so uh these guys live widespread and also like farmland, uh, native forest and scrub, uh, typically around there. They're also flightless and they don't really have a tail. There's lots of really weird things about the kiwi. Uh, they also have uh, bones that are full of marrow instead of being hollow like most birds. They also have technically the shortest beak of any bird. And you think that's weird considering how long it is, but the reason is because usually... Um, Beaks are measured from the nostril to the base, and the ba uh, nostrils are right down the base of the uh, beak for these guys, so they technically have the shortest beak. Um, they also have the largest egg of uh, um, comparative body size out of pretty much any bird. They like huge eggs, and if you see the skeleton in them, they're really just uh, huge eggs, and that's actually really important in their breeding ecology, as I've explained. Uh, they typically reach a length of about 40 centimeters and they get uh, two kilograms for males and females can get really big up to even like three kilograms. Females tend to typically tend to be a little bit larger than the males. Uh, and as the name suggests, their body's brown, so it's a name brown kiwi, where they have this long beak, well technically uh, long beak. And uh, they have these kind of whiskers going around here that helps them feel around as they're foraging. Um, these guys, as I mentioned, the most common of Kiwi, there's about 35,000, but they are still considered vulnerable because of introduced predators such as stoats and stuff like that. A lot of the young, before they reach a size big enough to defend themselves, which is about a kilogram, they tend to be eaten uh, by stoats and things. And actually the survival rate of wild Kiwis is about 95, uh, only 5%. So if you just let the Kiwis go, their population will uh, continue to decline until basically they become extinct with like only a few making their first year and then basically as the population ages they just dwindle and dwindle but luckily there is operation nest egg so these um they will take in wild kiwi eggs and raise them for their first year of life in captivity where basically they will rear them up and then release them into the wild once they're big enough to defend themselves from stoats and that's actually been a really successful conservation uh a strategy and their populations are now just starting to increase uh in lots of areas just due to this and also uh 1080 um operations uh culling uh, invasive predators things like that they've been doing quite well um in terms of breeding these guys can lay eggs pretty much any month of the year they're typically june november well, that's a baby uh, june to november uh, the nest is usually in a small burrow or a hollow base of a tree with a clutch size of about one to two and the white egg is very large and then the female kind of runs off does her own thing and leaves the big egg to the male and the legs are only left unintended during the night and the male then comes back and incubates so then once the baby is hatched they will live for like a few weeks off the yolk and that big egg allows them to uh the babies when they hatch will allow them to pretty much be ready to go once they're born they just need to grow up a bit and another thing that makes them weird they are flightless and nocturnal they're very much like a, a bird trying to be a mammal these guys will come out at night and uh, push through the undergrowth and look for small insects and they'll also probe with their beaks in the soil looking for worms these guys will pretty much eat anything small they sometimes will eat fruits uh, but they typically find small invertebrates like earthworms beetle larvae centipedes wetter things like that very generous in that regard 
So really, really awesome. Really cool little uh, birds. It's really nice to see some New Zealand animals finally represented in Planet Zoo. And as we got here, we've got the special white kiwi. It's actually uh, not an albino, but it's actually kind of like a leucistic like, gene that has been found in some kiwis. They've, there's been a couple in captivity. I managed to see one uh, at Mount Bruce where they breed kiwis and hold kiwis sometimes. Really, really awesome animal. Big fan of these little kiwis. Um, I love these guys. It's really nice to finally see these ones. Uh, this one was done by Nora Waller. Uh, I believe it was a commission from a friend of mine. Really, really awesome to see the uh, nice kiwis and some more New Zealand birds in Planet Zoo. I'm a really big fan. Really, really beautiful. And last but most, certainly not least, we're moving on here. We have got by uh, Genora Pizza and Gaboy. We have got the brown hyena really really awesome here so these guys are also known as the um, starred wolf these guys are found in namibia botswana and um, western and southern zimbabwe south africa and mozambique uh, they are currently the rarest species of hyena as well and the largest population is found in the kalahari desert in southwestern africa where the population is estimated to be between 4,000 and 10,000, which makes them as near threatened by the uh, um iucn so these guys typically like open woodland savannas, deserts, semi-deserts, things like that. And they actually can survive quite close to urban areas uh, due to scavenging. Um, and these guys will favor rocky mountainous areas and look for shade and readily available uh, water sources. With home ranges that can get between 233 to 466 kilometers or 90 to 180 square miles. And although found uh, today only in Africa, in the past they actually lived up to the Iberian Peninsula and perhaps into parts of Europe and the like upper Pliocene, things like that. So these guys are distinguished from other species of hyena with these long shaggy coats where it's like brown down the bottom here and they have these striped legs as well. They get the name the brown hyena because their coat is quite brownish. They've got quite long hair, these stripes on their legs, things like that. A little bit creamy um, or color, uh, cream colored on their necks and then it gets darker as you reach their rump. Uh, they're typically about 144 centimeters uh, long on average, with a range between 130 to 160, or 51 to 63 inches, with a shoulder height also of 70 to 80 centimeters, or 28 to 31 inches, and a tail that's about 25 to 35 centimeters, or 9 to 13 inches long. And, unlike, and like the larger spotted hyena, there's not really a major difference between the sexes. It, the weight for an average adult male is about 40 to 43 kilograms or 89 to 96 pounds or females on average are slightly smaller about 37 to 40 kilograms or 83 to 89 pounds and these guys like other hyenas they've got quite powerful jaws and young animals are actually able to crack the leg bones of um, springbok within five minutes of birth although it deteriorates over time as they kind of age and these skulls uh, of brown hyenas are actually larger than those of the striped hyena, and they're definitely more robust. And this indicates they're generally less generalized. Um, they tend to um, typically want to eat bigger things. They're typically just scavengers, things like that. Um, they also actually have a hierarchy that's very comparable to that of wolves with a mated pair and their offspring. They live in clans or extended families of up to six individuals and these clans will defend the territory and all members will help take care of the babies and territories are also marked by um pasting which they will deposit secretions from their large anal gland that's located at the base of the tail on boulders and vegetation to mark their territory they also maintain a stable clan hierarchy through ritualized aggressive displays and mock fights and things like that and they can move up in rank uh by killing a higher rank male in confrontation, why alpha females are usually just the oldest female. Uh, and in terms of their reproduction, we'll look at these cute little babies if we can find them here. Look at these cute little guys. So <laughs> really cute little fellows. So the brown hyena, they typically do not have a breeding season and females typically produce their first litter about two years old. They will typically mate from May to August and male and females of the same clan usually do not mate with each other and rather females will mate with nomadic males. Uh, clan uh, males display no resistance to this behavior and will assist the females in raising cubs. Females give birth in dens, which are like hit, typically hidden in sand dunes and things like that, where they're hidden from lions and spotted hyenas. They typically will gestate for about three months, and the mothers will produce one litter about every 20 months or so. And usually only the dominant female breeds, but if two litters are born in the same clan, the mothers will nurse each other's cubs, though favoring their own. And litters can between, be between one to five cubs and weigh about one kilogram at birth. And unlike the spotted hyena, brown hyena is actually born with their eyes closed and open them after eight days. 
these cubs are weaned after about 12 months or about a year um and uh they leave their dens in about 18 months and unlike spotted hyenas all adult members of the clan will carry food back to the cl uh, cubs and they are not fully weaned and do not leave uh, the den until they reach about 14 months of age. And they reach their full size at about 30 months. Uh, and their lifespan is typically about 12 to 15 years. So quite long lived. We'll have a look at this cool little female here. Uh, in terms of their ecology, they're primarily scavengers. And they will uh, typically prey upon um, and try and steal carcasses for, that are killed by larger predators. But they will eat things like rodents, insects, eggs, and fungi. And although they are poor hunters, they will actually still hunt prey. They can hunt, and they do hunt rather successfully. But it only makes a small portion of their diet. They'll eat species such as spring hare, spring bok lambs, bad-eared foxes, and kohans, which only make about 4% of their diet. And while in the Namibia coast, they'll actually feed a lot on um, Cape fur seal pups as they'll kind of take them. They also have an exceptional sense of smell and can locate carcasses kilometers away. They are quite aggressive kleptoparasites and they will frequently take kills away from animals such as black uh, black jackals, leopards and cheetahs since they're bigger and able to scare them off. Uh, single brown hyenas actually may chase leopards with their jaws held wide open and can actually um, attack like adult male leopards so they're quite aggressive. They've been also observed treeing leopards and even when no killers and uh, connections they're able to like kind of scare off those big leopards and the kalahari desert they're often the um dominant male mammalian carnivore because of this behavior and also there's not many lions or wild dogs in the area so they typically kind of take the role as top predator in that area and in areas where their territories are lap brown hyenas and also um may actually get killed by spotted hyenas and lions and brown hyena cubs also susceptible to being killed by african wild dogs and blackback jackals so in terms of the uh, activity, in terms of the Kalahari, they're typically active at night and they search for spoo uh, um, food around like 31 kilometers on average with territories about 54 kilometers or 33 miles have been recorded. And they actually may catch um, excess food and shrubs and holes and they recover it within 24 hours. So if they find extra food, they will kind of hide it and then come back to it later when they're hungry. As I mentioned, the global population is estimated to be between 4,000 and 10,000 individuals, and they are listed as near-threatened in the IUCN list. And the major reason for this is basically human prosecution, since most people believe that they are harmful to livestock, when that is definitely not the case. Farmers have found them scavenging on livestock and um, wrongly assume that they killed it, but typically they just scavenge. Um, they're also bodies occasionally used for judicial medicine, and they're not really highly sought from the trophy department, so luckily they're okay in that regard. But their bodies are sometimes killed for traditional medicines and rituals and obviously protect livestock. Luckily, there are several conservation areas for that are home to the brown hyena, such as the Estonian National Park in Namibia, the Central Kalahari Game Reserve in Botswana, and the Kinaglari Trans Frontier um, Park as well, so that's really good. And they manage and aid in the conservation of these animals, such as education programs, and um, they try to dispel myths and promote individuals and problem individuals are removed from farmlands and urbanized areas. So typically they are doing uh, okay, as they consider near threatened. Again, this wonderful mod was done by Good Boy and uh, Genora Pizza. Really did an awesome job of portraying this wonderful species. And I think this looks like a frontier quality mod and it's just really, really nice. So um, yeah, I think this would be a very great place to end the video. So um, I uh, really, really, really hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you guys like and subscribe. Always remember to hit the little bell icon to get notified about anything. So yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe, and bye bye